Again, we need to ask God to guide us. We never open the Bible without really asking the Spirit of God to speak to us. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So let's bow our heads and ask God to be with us this evening. Father in heaven, again tonight, as we have done before, we do again. We know that minds wander, that our hearts are sometimes full of evil. We recognize that Many times we come even into the house of the Lord and our minds and hearts are not ready to receive what your spirit is ready to give. And so tonight, Lord, push the world away. Forgive every sin. Open our minds like a flower blossoming to the Son of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Interpretation. A lot of people ask me about, how do you interpret the Bible? You know, one pastor down the road, he interprets it this way. Uh, this teacher over here, he interprets it that way. And then there's the uh, guy on television, and he interprets it in an altogether different way. So how do you deal with interpreting the Bible? Let's go to the Bible and find out. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, but we know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture, read the last few words with me, is a matter of one's own interpretation. Doesn't matter what the preacher down the street thinks. Doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. It's not a matter of a private interpretation. That means the Bible is not up to just the whim and thinking, and I think it means this, why well, I think it means that, why well, I think it means this. Why? Well, the Bible tells us because no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Didn't come from us. Didn't come from the human being, but rather the Holy Spirit of God. Mark it down. The Bible is its own interpreter. When you come to a port of, part, portion of Scripture... You wonder what it means. You wonder where it's going. You always compare Scripture with Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, as we found out the other evening. And when you begin to look at the whole Bible, it makes an interpretation of itself. What I want to do tonight is I want to go to the Bible and discuss something that is in one way, affecting every one of us here in this room. Doesn't matter what church you go to. It's affected all of us. Is it possible, by the way, is it possible to uh, read the Bible, to pray, go to church, have your devotions, and uh, not do the will of God? Is that a possibility? Is it a possibility to be a church member, be baptized, you know, read your Bible, Pray, give your tithes and offerings, but still not be doing the will of God. It's a good question, isn't it? Jesus answers this question in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that's a believer. Oh, I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus. Oh, I go to church. Hallelujah. Oh, I give my tithes and offerings. Praise the Lord. Oh, you know, I pray and I read the Bible and I go to Bible study on Tuesday night and I go to Bible study on Thursday night and I go to Bible study on Sunday night. Oh, I'm a big Bible study. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying some believers who say, Lord, Lord, will, enter, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. In other words, it's very clear that the will of God must be done for us to be a part of God's people. It's not just lip service. It's not just happening to go to church. We must do the will of the Father and the Son. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many works of power. These aren't secular people. These are people within the church who seemingly have powers, throwing out demons, healing, and so forth. What does Jesus say? Then I will de de declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
It is very important to do the will of Christ. It's not just simply going to church. It's not just simply reading the Bible. It's not just simply even coming to meetings like this. It's not just simply, you know, uh, giving to the Lord. We must be doing the will of God in order to really, really be God's people. You can see this down through time that there's been a lot of religious people that uh, actually have been lost. You know, Cain, we think of Cain as a bad man. Uh, he wasn't a bad man. Did Cain love God? Yeah, he loved God. He loved him enough to bring a sacrifice. Did he know about God? Did he believe in God? You better believe it. Did he pray? Absolutely, he prayed. Cain wasn't a bad man. He was a very religious man. Yet he did not do God's will in spiritual matters. Oh, he had a good show. And probably he had a heart of love to a point. But he wanted to do it his own way. And we're all in that. You know, I know what the Bible says, but I want to do it my way, Dan. I know what the Bible says, but I want to do it what my church is doing way. We all have that. He did not do God's will in spiritual matters. And then out of jealousy, he killed his brother Abel who worshipped and obeyed the will of God. It's more than just simply being religious or Christian. Are you really following the will of God? Another example are the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Were these religious leaders religious? Why, certainly they were. They are probably more religious than anybody in this room. Did they love God? You better believe it. In fact, the Pharisees, to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize word for word the Old Testament. The whole entire Old Testament, word for word. You talk about religiosity. Did they love God? Yes. Did they pray to God? Yes. Did they read the Bible? Yes. But yet the Jewish leaders at the time of Jesus were extremely religious, yet they wanted to keep their religious traditions rather than obeying the will of God. Again, unless we come to a point where we follow the will of God in our life, the religiosity, just going to Bible study, and just reading a Bible in the morning, and going to church, well, people have done that for thousands of years, and they've been lost. It's important to follow the will of God as revealed in His Word in our life. You find this out even in the medieval church, and we looked a little bit about that last night. Blew a lot of you away how the Roman Empire made a compromise with Christianity. We found out that the Christian church throughout history has been very religious, extremely religious. Instead of following God's will, the church substituted man's tradition in place of the commandments of God. We found a little bit about that last night. Some of the things that we take for granted. Some of the things that we just don't even question. Actually have nothing to do with Jesus or the Bible or the commandments of God. Are they religious people that uh, put these things into play? Were they sincere? Were they Bible believing? God fearing? Yes. But they chose to do their own will rather than the will of the word, the law, and of Jesus' teaching. Now, last night, we kind of touched on this, this blending of the two. If you weren't here last night, I really urge you to get the material. The blending of the two that produced 300, 350 years after Jesus, it produced a brand new religion on the world, and most of it, 90% of it, is still out there, and most of us have believed in it right up to this day. It's an amazing Great deception that has come down through the history of the Christian church. Now this should not surprise us because Paul tells us there's a prophecy that's going to have a tremendous apostasy in the Christian church before Jesus comes. It's found in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4. Paul says, let no one in any way deceive you for it. What's the context here in 2 Thessalonians 2? He's talking that it here is Jesus' second coming. For it, the coming of Christ, will not come unless the apostasy 
Now that's a very uh, religious word, you know, the apostasy, you apostatize from the faith. What's he talking about here? He's talking in a Christian sense, Jesus coming isn't going to happen unless the apostasy or the falling away from following Jesus' teachings in the Bible comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now I've, I've read all sorts of material that talks about the man of sin coming after Jesus returns, you know. There's this secret coming, and then the Antichrist, or the man of sin, comes upon the scene. But notice what Paul says here, that happens before Jesus comes. It's amazing as you begin to take a look at the Bible. And we're going to be developing this tomorrow and also Friday night. We're getting into some of the end time stuff now. But the apostasy in the church comes before Jesus comes back to the world. And we began to see, just a few hundred years after he went back to heaven, how the mystery of iniquity, that's how Paul phrases it in another part of the New Testament, how this compromise, how this apostasy merges with Christianity, blurring, deceiving, not just some of us living even in the 21st century, but billions of people down through the Middle Ages. What we would like to do tonight is we would like to go to the prophecy dealing with part of this great apostasy. Now you can look at it from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. That's the one talking about the mark of the beast. We're going to spend a whole night on the mark of the beast. These two are side by side. They are sister prophecies. In fact, as you get to the Mark of the Beast in Revelation 13 and list the identification points, as we're going to be listing the identification points tonight, they match perfectly. It's the same prophecy given by God to these two men, Daniel and John the Revelator. Well, let's begin reading in Daniel 7. I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts from the earth came up, from the sea, each different from the other. Daniel 7, 2 and 3. The Bible has a lot of symbols in Bible prophecy. You know, animals and wind and, and oceans and water and all this stuff. What does it all mean? Symbols never lose their meaning. Here Daniel, in his vision, he sees these four beasts. Uh, you, we wouldn't say beasts today. That's kind of an archaic word. Animals. He sees these four animals coming up out of the sea. And we begin to find out symbols. What are some of these symbols? For instance, the sea. They're coming up out of the sea. What does waters represent in Scripture? In prophecy, Revelation 17, 15 says, The waters which you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations. So the water, of course, are peoples. A sea of faces. You know, we talk about that. I looked out, and there, as far as the eye could see, was a sea of people. Well, what does it mean? It means a huge amount, a multitude of people. Water represents multitudes, nations. What do the winds represent? Jeremiah 51, verses 1 to 4, talks about, I will raise up against Babylon a destroying wind. Well, is that talking about a tornado or a hurricane? No, it's talking about the winds of war. We still use these expressions. You don't even know where half of the expressions you use from time to time. They come from the Bible. Winds of war. In fact, we even used the term desert storm a few years ago. The whole understanding of a mighty wind is warfare. It comes right from the Bible. So here, warfare among the people, the ocean, the sea, means the people. Here there was warfare back and forth between the peoples, the nations, and out of that warfare comes four great political powers. Daniel seven seventeen. these great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. So the picture is set. In this vision, you have these four animals, as the warfare among the nations ebb back and forth, four great kingdoms arise. Let's take a look at each one. Daniel 7, verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on its feet like a man. 
as you take a look at the Bible, you begin to find that the lion was Babylon's national symbol. You find this in Jeremiah 51 verse 7, and a lion has come out of his lair, a destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his place to lay waste your land. Not just simply a lion, but literally in the ruins of Babylon, the winged lion was their national sim symbol. We, we looked at this the other night when we went to Babylon. This ancient uh, statue of a lion is still there. Probably been there for 2,500 years. Daniel probably walked by it. But it's a winged lion. We looked at a processional street. Alongside a processional street were these lions. And they each had eagle's wings. It was a symbol of Babylon even during the time of Daniel and Jeremiah. So we begin to put these things together. We found out the other night in that great metal man that the head of gold was Babylon, and now God in Daniel 7 is talking about a lion as the same kingdom of Babylon. Well, it goes on. The next animal that comes out of the ocean, out of the warfare, was like a bear. Daniel 7 verse 5, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. They said, thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. We know from history what happened after Babylon. The great Mediterranean power, the Medes and the Persians, came against Babylon. Probably the three ribs in the mouth of this bear are the three nations that it had to overthrow to dominate the Mediterranean area, probably raising itself up on one side, on one shoulder, as the prophets they said, indicated one of these dual powers, because it was a dual power to begin with, the Medes and the Persians. Persia ultimately dominated and became the Persian Empire. The Bible con continues to uh, link these two together, the breast and arms of silver, as we looked at the other evening, and the bear is also talking about this power of the Medes and Persians. Next animal. After this I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird, and the uh, beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Daniel 7 verse 6. Next great empire, we've already studied this, was Greece. Alexander the Great. The Grecian Empire. Uh, four heads. Well, possibly the four sections of the Grecian Empire. When Alexander died, basically the four generals that he had divided the empire up among themselves. Each one took a section. Leopard is a very fast animal. Uh, the wings. Wings in the Bible denote swiftness. You find this in the book of Revelation. Four wings on a fast animal means super, super fast. That's exactly what Alexander did. He conquered the then known Mediterranean world faster than any other conqueror up to his time. So the belly and thighs of that metal image that's a brass correlates with this four-headed leopard that uh, arises in the world. There's another one. The last one. After this I saw in my night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong and had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. The next power that came along in the Mediterranean area, biblical area, was Rome. The legs of iron that we studied the other night and this uh, dreaded beast. In fact, the, there was no animal that he likened it to. It was like a dragon. It was like a, a horrible, nondescript type animal with ten horns. Well, as you begin to find that Rome ultimately is this uh, nondescript animal with ten horns. In fact, the Bible says here in Daniel 7, 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. If you were here the other night, that great metal man, Rome, that iron kingdom of the legs, broke apart, some strong, some weak, some clay, some iron, ten toes, ten horns. I mean, we're talking about the same thing here, whether you're looking at it from Daniel 2 or Daniel 7. Fascinating thing about the Bible is that one prophecy will take you so far, and then it kind of closes out. The next prophecy will have the same identification points and it'll come down to the same place you were before, but it'll go a little further. 
Ah, I understand now a little bit more. And then there's going to be another prophecy that will take you down the same identification point, down to where that prophecy was, and then it'll take you a little further. That's what I'm talking about, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, their sister. We're going to go so far tonight in Daniel 7, Revelation 13 takes us right down to exactly where we're studying tonight in Daniel 7, but it takes us beyond even to our day. Fascinating way the Bible has things written out. Again, the Bible is its own interpreter. So as we begin to see this, we begin to see that the Roman Empire broke apart, just like we found out the other evening with that metal man. So we find out in Daniel 7 that ten horns arise out of this kingdom. There isn't a fifth animal, or a sixth animal, or a seventh animal. Just like in that metal man, nothing comes after the feet of iron and clay. Now Rome broke apart history records, in the year 476 A.D. Now, can you read that? What year was the breakup of the Roman Empire? You read it for me now. What year was it? Good. You're going to see that in a few more minutes. Hang on to that date. Hang on to that date, because you will see this has a part to play in our understanding of prophecy. Well, at this point, Daniel 7, verse 8, begins to draw attention to a little horn that comes up among the ten horns. Now, Daniel 2 stops with the feet of iron and clay. This uh, prophecy brings us down to this animal with ten horns, but here's where it goes on. It gives us more detail. Notice, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn came, another horn, a little one, came up among them. This is where we want to focus our study tonight on this little horn. A lot of people identify this little horn as maybe uh, with the Antichrist or something of that nature. We're going to take a look at it tonight. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at this on future nights as well. But I want to share with you this little horn. This eight principles of the little horn in this prophecy that apply to this power. Now you can go out and read all sorts of books on this. And I've read, I guess, oh, a dozen or at least. Here's the problem. All eight of the points that we're going to study in a moment have to fit this power. You can't, and I've read books, where they'll take one or two or three points, as we're going to point out here in a moment. They'll take two or three of the eight They'll write a whole book about it, you know, a whole scenario uh, about the, the, what, what it is and everything, and they leave out three or four or five points. And I've talked to some professors about this, you know, some people who write these books. I say, what about this? What about that? What about the other thing? And basically, in a very uh, politically correct way, they basically say, well, it didn't fit my theory, so I left them out. You can't do that. You just can't do that. If God gives eight identification points of this little horn power, all eight have to fit. So let's go and begin to read the prophecy where it tells us these eight points, these eight identification points. Daniel 7, 8, 21 and 24. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise. In other words, when Rome broke apart, it was broken apart by the Germanic tribes, the ten Germanic tribes that ultimately broke apart Western Rome. Going on. And another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts, and he will speak words against the Most High, and wear down the saints of the Highest One. He will think to make alterations in times and laws, and they will be given unto his hand for a time, times, and half of time. You know, everything about these animals was nothing more than introduction for Daniel. If you look at the prophecy, you know, the animals boom, 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 and then boom, the whole focus of Daniel 7, this prophecy, is on this little tiny horn. 
In other words, it takes the prophecy beyond from where Daniel 2 went. So now this is the focus of Daniel. Who is this? What is this? When does it happen? So let's put down the eight identification points on the screen tonight. Number one, the Bible says it has a definite time to appear. Number two, it is a small, it's a little horn. Remember the horns were ten kingdoms? Well, this was a little kingdom, little horn. It's a little influential European nation. It would be different from the first horns. Number four, it would destroy three other nations. Number five, it would speak great words against God. It would be a persecuting power. It would attempt to change God's times and laws. And it would rule for a time, times, and half of time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take them one by one and see exactly what the Bible says. Remember, the Bible interprets itself. As you take a look at the Bible and see what happened as history went by, you begin to see exactly what God is trying to tell us. Number one of these eight identification points, it appears at a definite time. Let's go look at the prophecy, and here it is. Daniel 7, verse 8, As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise. Now, those would be the ten Germanic tribes that broke apart Rome. And another, this is talking now about that little horn, another will arise, what's the word? Read it, read it, help me out. After them. Aha! Now we got a qualifier going on here. After the ten horns are there, this little horn comes up after they're already established. So, let's go back into history. The breakup of the Roman Empire. What year did it occur? Yeah, you can read real good, can't you? <laughs> it did. 476 A.D. This little horn cannot come upon the scene of action before 476 A.D. Because the Bible says it comes up after these Germanic tribes had already broken apart the Western Roman Empire. Let's go to the next one. We're going to be layering these and we're going to be seeing a picture painted as we continue on. Number two. It says it is a small, influential European nation. Here's the prophecy. Daniel 7, verse 8. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise. We know that that is talking about the ten uh, Germanic nations of Europe that ultimately have become the nations of Europe that we know today. And another little horn came up. Here it is. What's the next word? Among them. This little horn doesn't pop up in China. Doesn't pop up in South America or North America. This little horn comes up after these ten horns are established. And it comes up among them. In other words, it has to be in Europe. These are the European nations that ultimately broke apart the Roman Empire. This little horn comes up among them. Well, let's go to number three. It would be different from the other European nations. What's the prophecy? Here it is. Daniel 7 verse 8. And another shall rise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones. And there's a lot of qualifiers going on about this little horn. He comes up after them. Uh, he comes up among them. And now he's different from them. It's amazing. Well, as we take a look at what really took place, when basically Constantine, we talked about him last night, he was the instigator of giving birth to a brand new faith in the world, a blend of paganism and Christianity, all, you know, mixed up together, passed off, came through the Middle Ages, still being practiced by, by millions and hundreds of millions to this day, well, Constantine ultimately went to the Eastern Roman Empire. Remember, he consolidated the Western. Ultimately, he left Rome, went to the East. We call it the Byzantine Empire. Have you ever heard of the city of Istanbul, Turkey? You know, it's a real original name. When Constantine moved his Roman seat of empire there, it was Constantinople. Constantine, Constantinople. 
So anyway, what's going on here? Constantine leaves Rome. The Western Roman Empire is crumbling. How is it crumbling? These Germanic tribes are throwing off the Roman yoke. Rome somewhat decayed from within. The Germanic tribes of the north came and began to pull apart the power of Rome. Constantine basically got out of there in time and established the Eastern Roman Empire. So that's what's going on around this period of time. They're throwing off the Roman power. And when you say, well, what do you mean they? One of the Germanic tribes' names were the Franks. Well, they're the French today. The Visigoths. Well, that's an unusual name you don't hear very often, but that were the, they were the uh, ancestors of the Spanish. Suvi, Portuguese. You got the Anglo-Saxons, the English. Lombards actually became the Italians. The Burgundians became the Swiss, the Alamanni, the German. These were the ancient Germanic tribes that really broke apart ancient Rome. Now when they broke apart ancient Rome, at first they were very, very happy. Rome was a slave taskmaster. You know, as, as you take a look, every race on earth, think about this now, every race on earth has been in slavery to some other race on earth at some time in the world's history. And these Germanic tribes were slaves to Rome. Well, you can imagine when the slaves were set free, when the rebellion and Rome basically was broken apart, you can imagine how it was a thrill, a joy, freedom, so forth. But what they begin to discover is that even though now Rome was no longer politically in charge, it was Rome that had kept them all together. It was Rome that had been the glue that kept the empire together. It was Rome that kept them from annihilating each other. Yeah, the, the cultures in Europe, if you go back, way back in these days, are so varied. In fact, they're still pretty varied. You know, you got Oktoberfest with the Germans and you got your, your very unique things with the English. I mean, even to this day, the nations of Europe are very culturally diverse. And, and it was back in those days. And Rome was the thing that kept them all glued together. Now Rome's gone. They knew they were in trouble. But there was one thing they did have in common. And that was their religion. They were Christian. Now, how did they become Christian? Well, Jesus told his disciples and the early Christians, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. They took it literally. They went to the Germanic... In fact, during the time of the uh, disciples and the early Christian church, these people up there, the Franks and the Swiss and the, the, uh, the Scandinavians and all these Germanic people, they were barbarians, at least in the view of the Romans. They were just wild people. But that's where the gospel went. The gospel went all the way up, as far north in Scandinavia, as far east into at least India that we know of. Many parts of China now are saying that in the first or second century AD, Christianity entered China. It's unbelievable that the early Christian church fanned out. That's why European history, going all the way back to the time of Constantine, is Christian. Christian roots. It's where it comes from. So now when Constantine's gone, the Roman Empire is in shambles. They turn to the church to pull them back together again. Now in those days, they had bishops. Now a bishop was nothing more than a leader of the church of a certain geographical spot. He had the Bishop of Rome. And that's who, by the way, they turned to. Because it was kind of in their geographical area. But there's also the Bishop of Alexandria, Egypt. Bishop in Jerusalem. Bishop in Antioch. Bishops in various parts of the world. But a bishop was nothing more than a religious leader. The Germanic tribes came down to the Bishop of Rome. And asked the Bishop of Rome to fill the place of Caesar... Not just spiritually, not just being a spiritual leader, but fill the place of Caesar politically and spiritually. 
And this began rise to the medieval church. In fact, I want to read some statements on this from the American Catholic Quarterly Review. Long ages ago in Rome, through the neglect of the Western Roman emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes. The Romans turned to one figure and asked him to rule them. Thus commenced the temporal, that means political, sovereignty of the popes. The pope is nothing more than the bishop of Rome. The pope is another name for the bishop of Rome. And meekly speak, stepping to the throne of Caesar, political, that was the literal throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ picked up the scepter of Caesar. He now holds political and religious power to which the emperors of kings and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. When did this happen? This happened in 538 AD. Now can you say that? Can you remember that? Say it with me. 538 A.D. You're going to have to remember that because you're going to see it in a few minutes as we move forward. Notice what history states. History of the Christian church. Vigilus ascended the papal chair uh, in 538 under the military protection of Belisarius. This was unique in the fact that the church now took on a sense it had never taken on before the Christian church changed drastically at this point in time, evolving into a political and religious power, and that year was 538 A.D. So that is a definite turning point in church history. Before that, to a great extent, it was uh, spiritual. Now, all of a sudden, in an official capacity, they began to look at it not only as a spiritual guide, but now in charge of politics as well. Church, state coming together. 538 A.D. Let's go to the next identification point. The church would subdue or defeat three nations. Here's the prophecy. Another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings or kingdoms. Now the word subdue, we don't use that word much anymore. It's kind of an archaic word. Destroy. He's going to destroy three of these kingdoms. Well, as we take a look at history, we find out something indeed happened that did away with three of these Germanic tribes. You know, there was a lot of missionaries that went out from the church in these days. Uh, a lot of them had their own ideas. One of them was Arius. Have you ever heard of Arianism? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. But Arianism was uh, taught by its founder, Arius. And what did Arianism teach? It taught that Jesus Christ was not the divine Son of God. Within Christianity, in fact, it's still alive and well today. And if you haven't heard about it, good for you. I don't want you to hear about it because it's false. Jesus was the divine son of God. Isn't that right? But there's still some people, Christians now, who don't believe that Jesus was the divine son of God. They're what we would call Arians or the followers of Arius. Now the church, of course, didn't believe this, and the church made war over the three tribes that had become Aryan in their belief. And I want to show you what history has shown us. The first of these tribes that were destroyed by the church's army, now remember it was political, it just wasn't a spiritual entity, it now had an army, it was political. The papal armies destroyed the Hurrieli in 493, they destroyed the Vandals in 534, the Vandals in North Africa. The last of these three that accepted Arian doctrine were the Ostrogoths, and they were destroyed in 538. Now that should ring a bell. Why 538? Well, we just talked about 538. The last opposition now to the Bishop of Rome 
This is when it happened. When these three were finally subdued, destroyed, the last opposition to his political and religious rule came to an end. That's why 538 is a high point in church history. Now it's one thing to destroy or, you know, like in war. You go and, and we made war with the Germans or we made war with the Japanese. And, well, there's still Germans and Japanese around. But this is a little different. This wasn't just, you know, going against the people. This was ethnic cleansing. This was total annihilation. Have you ever met anybody who says, my background is, uh, is uh, Hurriuli? You know, my background's German, Benzinger. My mother's Swedish, my father's German. You could probably come up to me and say, well, you know, I come from, my ancestors are from Africa, or my ancestors are from South America. Or my ancestors are from uh, the uh, Asian countries, whether China, maybe Japan, or, or uh, Korean, or something of that nature. But nobody ever comes up and says, well, yeah, my ancestors were Hurriuli. Huh? Uh, my ancestors were vandals. And I don't mean the kind that come and rob your house, or spray graffiti. That's not what I'm talking about. Nobody hails from the Hurriuli, from the vandals, or from the Goths. Why? They were not just destroyed, they were annihilated. Very similar to what Hitler was trying to do in World War II. Erase a whole country, a whole people. And that's exactly what the church did in these three. Now the Bible tells us something. Daniel 7 verse 8 says, Three of the first horns, these are those three horns, were pulled out by the, what? Roots. Now when you get something out by the root, nothing is going to grow back. They're gone. They're eliminated. This little power would destroy three nations. Well, it goes on. The church would speak great words against God. Let's go ahead and read the prophecy. Here it is. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, Daniel 7, 25. What are great words? Well, great words, if you read it in the book of Revelation, remember on Revelation 13, when we get there, it'll use the word blasphemy. Same identification point, instead of using the term great words, it uses, he will speak blasphemies. Blasphemy. Um, what is blasphemy? You know, a lot of people have a lot of definitions about blasphemy, and I'm going to elaborate on this when we get into our Mark of the Beast discussion. But blasphemy basically is defined in the Bible as where men claim the attributes and the, the ability to, to do what God does as well as to be God on earth. Now, that seems outlandish from a Christian perspective. I mean, who, especially from a Christian perspective, who in Christianity would ever, ever come to that point? I guess you're beginning to see by now that this prophecy is really talking about us. It's talking about you and me. You say, well, what do you mean? Every Christian, if you go back far enough, this is where we came from. This prophecy is showing us the development and what happened and how things came to be. And so in a certain way, we're looking at ourselves tonight and some of it is not very pretty. And I think it takes mature Christians to take a look at yourself. You know, we always want to look at somebody else. Point the finger at somebody else. Well, tonight, God is revealing to us that apostasy. Jesus coming is not going to happen until the apostasy comes first. The man of sin. We're beginning to see this actually taking place in our, own, in our own background, in our own Christian heritage. Is it possible that even in the Christian community, someone could claim to be God on earth and even forgive sin? I want to read a couple of statements. They're rather painful. But I want to read here from the Ferris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Nobody holds the place of God but Jesus 
on earth. Isn't that right? Well, there's more. Our Lord no longer reigns. He has resigned all power and authority to the Pope. Jesus does continue to reign, doesn't he? Pope Leo XIII, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Nobody holds that place but Jesus. History of the councils. Thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director. Finally, thou art another God on earth. This is in our Christian background. This is in our Christian history. And we all go back there. You know, if we all go back, you know, a thousand or so years, there wasn't all the different denominations and groups. This is where we came from. It continues, Christ can forgive all sin, so can the Pope. You know, the Bible tells us only one can forgive our sins, and that's Jesus Christ. The priest holds the place of the Savior himself when by saying, Ego de absolvo, he absolves from sin. Dignity and duties of the priest. You can see very clearly that so sadly, I mean, we're, we're looking at ourselves tonight and some of it is not very pretty. But yet, yet the, the apostasy that came and is still among many of us to this day, we're going to see on future nights how God takes his remnant, last people of God on earth, and how he brings them back to the faith that was given to the saints of old. That is a fascinating study. I hope you can be able to be here for as many in the future as possible. Well, the next one, number six. The church would be a persecuting power. Here's the prophecy, Daniel 7, 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out, persecute the saints of the Most High. You know, as we think about this, it's hard as a Christian, to sometimes read our own history, isn't it? You know, it's one thing to have the pagan world persecute and destroy Christians. It's, uh, it's another thing to see Christians killing Christians, Christians persecuting other Christians. And yet it did happen, no doubt about it. You can read books, D'Avigny's volumes, History of the Reformation. You can read Fox's Book of Martyrs. You can, you can read a lot of church history on this. Clark's Commentary talks about this horrible time, the Inquisition. In the space of 30 years, the Inquisition destroyed by various kinds of torture, 150,000, another statement. It has been calculated that Rome, the medieval church, has directly or indirectly killed 50 million men and women who held to the Bible as the word of God. Really sad, isn't it? And yet, Paul tells us the apostasy would come Daniel tells us that this is exactly what take place. All this would happen. The man of sin, the son of perdition, all this apostasy within the church would happen before Jesus comes. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see really what this is talking about. Well, as we go on. Number seven. The church would attempt to change God's times and laws. Daniel 7.25 and he shall think to change times and laws. Now this is not talking about man's times and laws. And the reason is, is because every nation, uh, every peoples have laws, you know, human laws, back and forth. I mean, look at our own nation. I mean, there are so many laws <laughs> that have been enacted by Congress uh, from our beginning that they don't even know how many laws are on the books. I mean, and, and then they, 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 they have a law, and they do away with that law, and they put another law in its place. So this is not talking about man's laws, because man's laws are temporary, and they dissolve away. This is talking about, in a spiritual sense, God's law, God's time. The church would even try to change the law and times of God. It's almost beyond our imagination that this would even be in prophecy, but we can see very clearly that that is exactly what the church tried to do. Talked to you the other night. You know, when the sun goes down, the Bible says that begins the next day. Now, noon, or I should say midnight, when it becomes midnight, that's when it changes from, you know, p.m. to a.m. That's when we begin the new day. When did the switch 
of God's time when it deals with a 24-hour day come in? Well, it came in in around 1581. The church made a decree that the day will now begin at midnight rather than at sundown. So that's just a little. You say, well, that's kind of insignificant. Let's go to a bigger picture of how the church would attempt to try to think to change God's times and laws. Ferris Ecclesiastical Dictionary again has this provision for the church and for the leadership of the church. It says the Pope can modify divine law. Divine law would be God's law, of course. There's another statement here, Pope Nicholas. The Pope has authority and has, and has of ten, that's a mis, often, that's it, and has often exercised it to dispense with the demands of Christ. The Pope's will stand for reason. He can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing the law. The prophecy said that the church would even try to come along and change God's law. And now we're reading from church uh, uh, official statements that indeed the church leadership claims the ability to change even what God has set down in his law. Here's another statement. The Pope has power to change times to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Fascinating. Fascinating. Now, one part of God's law deals with God's time. And we looked at that the last two evenings. Hope you were here. You know, if you were not here the last two evenings, you've, you, you've gotten a huge hole in your understanding. This prophecy said the church would try to alter God's times and laws and in God's law is a certain understanding of God's time. What is it? We read it the other evening. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. This shocked a lot of people. You know, a lot of people talk about the Lord's day, the seventh day, the Sabbath day. Oh, that's the Jewish day. No, it's not the Jewish day. Well, that's the Adventist day. It's not the Adventist day. It's the day of the Lord. We call it the Lord's day. We don't call it the Jews day. We don't call it the Adventist day. The Lord's day. This is the Lord's time. You go to church many times. They tell me these are the Lord's hours. These are the Lord's. This is the Lord's day. This time, the church would try to even change. They would think to do it. You can't change God's law. Who is man that could ever come along and change God's law? I mean, who do you think we are, even in a church sense? As you take a look at the Bible, and it doesn't matter what Bible you read from, uh, you can read from the King James, you can read from the NIV, you can read from the New English, you can even read from the, the old Douay version, which is the Catholic version. doesn't matter what version you read. The Ten Commandments read the same. They all do. Um, the problem is with the catechism, and I talked to you about that last night. We have here a catechism of the Catholic doctrine. And I, I read to you out of this how they tried to change God's law. Well, it was prophesied as we're studying tonight. So, what goes on here? In the Ten Commandments, as you read it in the Bible, the Fourth Commandment refers to the Lord's Day, the Seventh Day Sabbath. If you pick up the Catechism and look to the section where it reads the commandments, the commandments are altogether different than the way the Bible reads it. For instance, what happens in the Catechism, they've taken the Second Commandment totally out. It's not in there. It's gone. It's been erased. They've taken the Fourth Commandment, dealing with the Lord's Day, and they've shoved it into the third position. Now, when you get rid of one commandment, it doesn't sound right, nine commandments. So what do you have to do? You have to divide the last commandment into two parts to make the... Ten Commandments. Now, as you begin to take a look at this, and as we read the other night, it's very clear 
that the church attempted, and the Bible in prophecy said, would think to change. You really can't change God's law. It would think to do it. But it tried to change the times of God even within God's law. Catechism has the question, what is the third commandment? Answer, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Well, in the Bible, that's the fourth commandment. Continuing, question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. A billion Roman Catholics understand Saturday is the biblical Lord's Day Sabbath of Jesus. Going on, question, why did we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. They would think to change God's time within God's law. And there are some catechisms back there at the literature DVD table. If you want to find that for yourself, you can. It's right there, right there printed. Well, as we continue to look at some of these other statements, the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Nowhere in church history are you ever going to read where the disciples or Christ changed the day. It's just not there. It comes from the compromise with Constantine, that pagan blend producing a brand new religion, not quite Christian, not quite pagan, kind of a little bit of both, that has been passed on as Christianity ever since those early days. I read this the other night. The th third commandment is remember the Sabbath day. Well, actually in the Bible it's the fourth. The celebration of Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday evening and lasts until sundown of Saturday. So basically Saturday is the Sabbath day. The, the church does not make any bones about which day is the Sabbath, the Lord's Day of Jesus? They simply say, by our authority, by our edict, we have made that change. It's a law of the church, not a law of God. And we, in their understanding, have the ability to make that change. You know, nobody has the ability to change God, His law, or the Bible. Nobody does. It stands firm forever, from lasting to everlasting. This was from a priest at the St. Catherine Church in Algonac, Michigan. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The day of the Lord was chosen not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Well, the next, number eight, the church would rule supreme for a time times half of time. Here's the prophecy. Daniel 7 verse 25, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. What in the world is that talking about? What's a time? Well, if you go to the book of Daniel, now remember the Bible principle, the Bible interprets itself. A time in the book of Daniel, and in other parts of the Bible for that matter, a time would be one year of literal time. One Jewish year. You read that in Daniel 4.25. Now Daniel's year, a, Jew, a Jewish lunar year, was actually 360 days long. It wasn't a a Julian calendar year. It was a lunar calendar. Now, one Jewish year would be one time. Now, give us an example. Well, remember when Nebuchadnezzar went insane? Do you remember that? Nebuchadnezzar went out and ate grass in the field like animals. You know, some people today smoke grass. Nebuchadnezzar ate grass. But anyway, he went insane for seven times. The Bible uses that word times. What does that mean? Well, we understand seven years. In fact, Babylonian history has a gap of Nebuchadnezzar of exactly seven years. He was king. Nothing mentioned about him. Seven years later, now he's king again. He went insane, the Bible says, and ate uh, grass, lived like a cow in the field. Well, if time is one Jewish year, 
times would be plural. That would be two Jewish years. It would rule for a time, times, and dividing of time, or half of a time. Now, when you add those together, one Jewish year, 360 days, two Jewish years, 720, half of a year would be 180, you come up with 1260 days. Now, at this point, I'm going to share with you a key to unlocking Bible time prophecy. This is crucial because you're going to see it tomorrow night, you're going to see it Friday night, you're going to see it when we talk about the mark of the beast, you're going to see it when we talk about mystic Babylon, the harlot, Revelation 17. In Bible time prophecy, one day equals one literal year of history. Now this isn't something I've dreamed up. You believe it. If you believe in the rapture, and if you believe in the tribulation, and if you believe in that scenario, you believe this principle, but nobody's ever told you about it. Well, we're telling you about it. I'm glad to do that. And I'm going to elaborate on it tomorrow night a little bit bigger. Tomorrow night's prophecy is huge. It's over 2,000 years in length. And it brings us down to a time the Bible identifies as the time of the end. It uses this principle. One day in Bible time prophecy equals one year of literal time. Where do we get some evidences for this? Ezekiel 4 verse 6 says, I have appointed you each day for a year. Also you begin to find in Numbers, Numbers I think it is 1434, after the number of the days in which you searched the land. This is talking about the spies that went into the land of Israel. They were in there 40 days, came back, gloomy report, we can't go in, boo-hoo, uh, woe is us. And uh, because of that, they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Have you ever wondered why it was 40 years in the wilderness? Here's why. For every day they searched out and did not have the faith to go in and take the land, each day for a year, even 40 years, they would have to stay in the wilderness. You see this in various parts of the Bible. By the way, Martin Luther understood this. John Wesley understood this. Some of the great theologians in the 18th and 19th century understood this. Isaac Newton, who is a mathematician, understood this. And he wrote about it. I'm going to share that with you tomorrow night. This is a fundamental key in unlocking Bible time prophecy, even what a lot of people are talking about as the tribulation and the seven years and all that sort of stuff. It comes right from this key, unlocking Bible time prophecy. Now don't walk out of here and say every time you read the word uh, day in the Bible it means a year. That's not what it's talking about. Day in terms of time prophecy. We're talking in the context of prophecy. Not just a story in the Bible. We're talking in the context of prophecy. So, one prophetic day equals one literal year of history. So this 1260 prophetic days, time, times, and half a time, is actually referring to 1260 literal years of history. So let's go and figure this out. The Bible says that this power would rule supreme for 1260 literal years. Now at the very beginning of our time together I told you to hold on to a, a date. The date when the church was unopposed. When it ruled supreme both politically and spiritually. That was the year 538 AD. Do you remember that? The last of those three nations were totally annihilated. The church stood supreme. The Bible says it would rule supreme for 1260 years. All right, let's do some arithmetic. 538, you add 1260 to that, it will bring you down to the year 1798. Now that's getting pretty close to our day. Yeah, that's not too far back. All right, so you say, all right, this little horn comes up among the other horns. You know, it subdues threes, and you go through all the various identification points, as we've already looked at. So you say to yourself, all right, what's going on in 1798 that would seem to stop the power of the church? Well, let's go and take a look at what was going on in Europe in 1798. It's fascinating to live this side 
of the prophecy. You can go back and check it out. Well, of course, the French Revolution was in full sway in Europe. What did the French do? They wanted to dominate Europe. They wanted to have one flag, one government, one ruler, Napoleon. But now they had a problem because of the church. The church was political and spiritual. The church ruled supreme even in politics. They knew, in fact, that's why Charlemagne, that's why Louis XIV, that's why all these conquerors in the past failed because of the church. Church ruled in matters of politics and religion. The French knew the only way they could subdue Europe under their flag, under their control, would be to get rid of the power of the church. You see, in those days, the church had the power, and I guess it still does, of uh, excommunication. Sometimes you hear that word thrown around. What does that mean? It means we're going to excommunicate you from the church and that you're consigned to hell. I mean, that's where you're going. No hope for you. Uh, in fact, during the Middle Ages, sometimes the Pope would threaten to excommunicate a whole country. One was Germany, King Philip. Another was England, King John. Uh, they got crosswise with the church, and the Pope comes along. He says, I'm going to excommunicate your whole country. Well, now the people wouldn't stand for that. They'd rise up and revolt. The power of the church was immense during these uh, medieval days. Well, the French came along, and they said, we're going to get rid of that power. If the church wants to excommunicate us, let them be. We're atheists. Don't worry about it. Age of reason. So they threw off the spiritual power of the church. That was number one. Number two, they had to deal with the political power of the church. Remember what was brought together in 538? The state power and, and, and religious power combined. Now if France was ever to take the European continent, it had to throw off the church's spiritual. They went atheistic. Now it had to throw off its political so what did they do? The French were in Rome. They were marching all throughout Europe. Are you aware that Napoleon Bonaparte's future son-in-law or his daughter's fiancé was murdered in Rome? Did you know that? Now, when this reached Napoleon Bonaparte and the French, Napoleon Bonaparte seized on the murder of his future son-in-law as an excuse to take down the Vatican. And you can read this in history. This is absolutely fascinating history, church history. The man that was in charge of the French troops, his name was Berthier. He was a French general. When he heard that Napoleon's son-in-law had been murdered, news came in, attack the Vatican, take the Pope prisoner. Now remember, he was a head of state. He is part of a country. This was given to the church way back in 538. Napoleon's Berthier, French general, marched on the Vatican, and you can read it here even in Encyclopedia America, and also in church history. I'm going to read that in a moment. In 1798, exactly 1260 years, after the rise of this power, exactly in the time frame of the Bible, time, times, dividing of time, in 1798, Hebertier made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal, what's the next word? Government, state. Here's another statement. This is from the modern papacy. Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. The Pope and the papacy was dead. Exactly as the Bible predicted. We're looking at our own church history tonight. Some of it has not been very pretty. But we're beginning to look at it through mature spiritual eyes. We know... In fact, many of us have, have heard or maybe 
seen or had people allude to some of the, the problems that the church has had, it has been prophesied all along that this would be. There's another prophecy we're going to be studying in a few nights. How God takes what seems to be ruin, what seems to be apostasy, and actually infuses it in the last days with biblical truth. Exactly what we're studying night after night right here. One of those, of course, is the Lord's Day, the seventh day Sabbath, that a lot of people are, are beginning to hear, maybe in a new context that they've never, ever heard before. But sadly, history does reveal that all eight points of this prophecy fit us, our Christian church history. The church rose to power after 476. The church was a religious political power. The church destroyed three of the Germanic tribes. The church became a small nation within Europe. The church's claim to, uh, the church claims to take the place of God on earth. The church is persecuted in the name of God. The church has endeavored to change God's law in the seventh day Sabbath of God. And number eight, the church ruled with all power for 1260 years. Some have been wondering, you know, does it really make any difference? You know, what about the Sabbath? I mean, does it really make any difference? The day of Jesus, the seventh day. We're told in Scripture that it is really a sign of our loyalty to God. We looked at that on Friday night and Saturday night. In fact, there's a text in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, a signal, a seal between me and them that they might know that I, the Lord, sanctify them. Why go into some of these things? Why study about these great points of faith? Jesus is bringing us back to his word. Aren't you glad for that? We are now in a point of revival and reformation in Christianity that really the world has never seen since the days of the disciples. This great falling away, this apostasy that was prophesied, has, has taken people and has actually numbed their senses as to really what the Bible is trying to get through to us. Jesus is now breaking through the superstition, breaking through the tradition, breaking through all of these things that sometimes keep us so bound up with our, with our traditions. and our, He is freeing us, pointing to some of these marvelous things. You know, it's just thrilling to meet with people like you. It really is. I love, and especially during this time of our series, I love to meet with the people that are coming because I know you really want to be here. You know, the sightseers are gone. You know, the ones that came just for a good time, just to see what was going on. But you are the real heart and soul of a Christian's mind and life that wants to follow and know the Word of God, who wants to follow Jesus Christ and what He said, who wants to follow the truth and the Word and the law of God. That's what makes these programs as we, as we study so exciting. We are a family. We are gathering together. We love the Lord. Everybody in this room, it is my hope and prayer, loves the Lord. It is my hope and prayer that everybody in this room wants to determine to follow Jesus. If you don't, I don't know why you're here, but you're here. We gather together. What a joy to allow the Spirit of God to move us into the will of God. To give us the ability and courage to obey the will of God. You see, there's a lot of people who go to church, who study the Bible, who pray, who do all these things, but they're not still following the will of God. God says, I want you, as you study, as truth is revealed, to walk in the light as you receive the light. That's my prayer every day. Lord, open to my life truth and give me the ability and courage and fortitude and strength to walk in what I know. Scripture, Jesus, and God's law displays. Father in heaven, as we have studied tonight, big things, 
We've looked at ourselves. We've looked at our history of our church, Christianity. It's amazing, Father, how you've been so patient with us. It's amazing how you've, you've been so kind and forgiving to us and how, how as we take a look at our past, as this great compromise and this great apostasy entered in and, and some of us are still in the grip of that compromise, Father, you're so loving and patient. Thank you, Jesus, for continuing to open our eyes. Thank you for continuing to shed light in our Christian experience. We are not content to be stagnant, Jesus. We don't want to just become so tradition and so down into our roots that, that we cannot see truth that's revealed. Oh, Lord, you're going to bring a lot, truth, lot of truth back before you come. We know that. Truth now is exploding all around us. Give us the willingness to wrap our arms around it, to embrace it, to love it, and to walk with Jesus in all the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.